Good evening, everybody. And uh, on behalf of the University of KwaZulu Natal's College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science, I would like to welcome you to another stimulating talk in our public lecture series, What Do Scientists Do? Um, my name is Tanya Reinhardt, and I'm the Science Centre Coordinator at the University's Science Centre, STEC at UKZN. Um, before we start, just some housekeeping rules. Um, as usual, please make sure that you muted your microphone. If you don't know, it's the uh, bottom, uh, bottom left hand side of your screen. Uh, and if it's green and flashing, um, then you're not muted. So it needs to have a red line across. Um, to save bandwidth, please switch off your videos as well. Um, if you have if you have the luxury to have lots of bandwidth, um, you can, I don't know, do whatever you like. Um, as to questions, uh, you can either ask Prof Slotter uh, uh, live at the end of the lecture, or you can post your question in the chat. If you get cut off because of load shedding or, I don't know, some other emergencies, please don't panic. We are recording the lecture and we will make it available online. And it's now a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Professor Rob Slutter. And uh, tonight, the title of tonight's talk is Elephants and Society Going Beyond the Biological to Explore the Importance of Considering Social and Societal Aspects Concerning Elephants, which have broad value to society. Um, a little bit about Rob. Uh, Rob Sloto is a professor at university at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and an honorary professor at the University College in London. He served as a UK as an executive for eight years as my boss, and so as a DVC Agriculture, Engineering and Science, and then as DVC of Health Sciences. Rob focuses on applied research that can be translated into practical solutions, working on conservation of large mammals, biogeography of invertebrates, land use planning for environmental sustainability, and environmental contribution to achieving sustainable development goals. He leads large transdisciplinary projects and is the Oppenheimer Fellowship in Functional Biodiversity to catalyze socio-ecological research and mentor emergency research researchers. Rob is also co-chair of the African Elephant Specialist Group. And it now gives me a great pleasure to hand over to you, Rob. Um, thank you for that introduction, Tanya, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see the uh, colleagues, some of my past students and colleagues from the school and uh, some other people that are known in broader society. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, can you hear me clearly, Tanya? Yes, you are, uh, you're very well audible. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I thought I'd give a, a brief introduction about myself and uh, how I came to work with elephants. Um, I did my PhD at the University of California and I studied social behavior of animals. And uh, my study species was a sparrow, so nothing like an elephant. But what I was studying is principles associated with social behavior and group living, including looking at elements of how animals uh, compete with each other in groups, how they signal to each other their relative status in groups, and how they then get various benefits from being in a group. When I came back to South Africa to start my job at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, it was then University of Natal in January 1996, I had to then think about what kind of research program I would like to develop in order to uh, make a contribution to South Africa and in terms of the training of students. And I initially did work with birds, but I also in the following year started doing research on lions. And one of the reasons I chose to work on lions was because they're a social species and I could use my experience and background in order to answer some questions about lions that weren't being looked at. And I was focusing especially on lions that had been introduced into small game reserves in South Africa. And that, that year, as I was engaging with colleagues at Finlandsburg National Park, 
there was a, a challenge that I'll come to later in the talk with uh, the behavior of male elephants. And part of the solution was applying understanding of behavioral ecology of group animals. And that's how I started working on elephants was that project. I then uh, expanded my work to a range of different areas. And I'm going to share some of those uh, elements of research on elephants with you as the start of the talk. And then as we go through the talk, I'm going to talk a bit more about the uh, social or the human side of conservation and how it's important to understand that and also drawing on my experience from elephants in terms of uh, bringing my understanding to those. I'm going to present the, the work of a, a range of different students and postdocs. Um, but certainly my life at UKZN has been one of working in teams and uh, really had excellent students, colleagues, collaborators from other institutions who've all contributed to what we've learned about elephants that I'll share with you. Um, elephants are an incredible species and I'll explain a bit later all of the benefits that we derive uh, from elephants as people, but also the role that they play in the environment. And this picture for me encapsulates a lot of the elements about elephants. The uh, uh, very sophisticated social behavior of a, uh, a female elephant and her calf, but also you'll see scattered around dung that elephants deposit and they're very much part of the ecosystem and have huge influence and impact on the ecosystem, uh, both positive and negative. I'll speak a bit about that. So I'll start off by um, just sharing a little bit about elephant society. Um, the uh, diagram here summarizes how elephants uh, are arranged in terms of their society. At the bottom left, you can see a, a blue circle that circles a, a female, a daughter, and her son and daughter. Um, and that's a, a small family unit. And that family unit is repeated in the herd so that you have a herd that is led by a matriarch with her daughters. It might be her sister if her mother had died. That's indicated by the cross at the top. Um, and you then have sons that as they get older, they then leave the herd as uh, maturing bulls and move away to bull areas. Elephant society is matriarchal. It's, it's, it's very much based around the female herds and with the matriarch or the lead female that leads a group. It's hierarchical. Um, they have overlapping generations as is uh, shown here, and they're also long lived. And those elements, because they're social, they have overlapping generations that are long lived and they're very uh, um, uh, highly developed in terms of their neural systems. There's been extensive cultural evolution in elephants. They have what's effectively a language of sounds and other ways that they signal to each other with chemical signals from secretions, but also uh, using uh, visual signals and visual cues. Um, they have traditions in terms of, for example, elephant roots through the landscape along elephant paths that persist for multiple generations um, and a number of other ways that they uh, behave uh, in traditional ways. They have extensive knowledge of the system. For example, we've seen elephants forage on plants that have medicinal properties which we know from our research for medicinal use for people. And when elephants are sick, they, um, they then uh, may eat those plants in order to treat themselves. Um, and they also have vast experience that they build up over the years across generations. Um, so the young daughter learns from her mother and the matriarch, her aunts, her grandmother, et cetera, and that experience is uh, a, a critical element of their ability to survive and persist. Um, bulls are, uh, once they leave the herd, uh, for the most part separate from the females and they occur in bull areas. Those tend to be areas um, away from rivers and prime areas where the females uh, tend to occur. And those bulls then compete with each other over the females. 
that competition can be extreme in terms of uh, they fight and they fight to the death. And that's why bulls are much shorter lived than the females. Uh, females can live up to around 70 years, whereas bulls tend to typically live between 45 and 55 years. Um, the, uh, they also have a phenomenon called must, and must is a evolutionary uh, uh, advantage that has uh, evolved in elephants in order to compete more effectively with each other for females. It's a heightened testosterone, and that heightened testosterone makes them more aggressive, and it makes them better able to fight uh, and to win fights. And I'll talk a bit about that during the uh, presentation. Um, I'm not going to show you too many graphs, but I, I do want to show you a few simple results just to emphasize some of the, the points that I'm making. Um, and the first set of, of graphs is work that was done by a, a postdoc of mine, uh, Graham Shannon, um, with colleagues from the UK. Um, and what the importance of the female group and of the matriarch. And what we did is we played recordings of uh, different sounds to the elephants, and then we measured their reaction. So it was an experiment where you wait till the elephants are settled, and then we have a very large speaker that uh, plays very low frequency uh, sounds, and those sounds, we then see what response comes from those females. And one of the things that we did is we played them the roars of lions, and the lions are important to elephants because lions do predate on elephants. In other words, uh, lions do catch calves and kill calves. And there's some groups of lions, uh, some prides that have learned to specialize on elephants that can kill uh, larger animals, not, not full adults, but larger animals. And so it's important to know about lions and how to respond to lions in terms of the risk that a female who's leading her group uh, uh, needs to deal with. So the first, in the top right, we played one lion roaring, and then we played a set of three lions roaring. And the response, the uh, intensity of the response shows that it's much higher when there are three lions and one lion. In other words, elephants can count. The second element that we looked at is the importance of uh, being able to discriminate male and female lions because uh, male lions are much more dangerous to elephants than female lions. Being bigger, you need to have male lions if you're going to uh, hunt an elephant as a pride of lions. And what we have is the white bars are the females' lions' roars, and then the, the gray bars are the male lions' roars. And then you have the age of the matriarch. And what you see is to female lions, it doesn't really matter how old the matriarch is that they respond in the same way. But to male lions, the response of the older matriarchs is much stronger than the response of the uh, younger matriarchs. And that's because the older matriarchs have learned that there's a danger from the male lions. And so they, they respond much more to danger than to just anything. And uh, it's summarized in the, in the bottom right where you can see the, the big difference in the gray bars for the older females. And that's a value of experience and of having matriarchs that live in this multi-generational society. Those were data from a normal elephant population. And we also looked at, uh, from Amboseli in Kenya, and we also looked at a, a population from Pilansburg and the Pilansburg animals came from Kruger Park at the time of culling. And at that time, they could only move small orphan animals. So these were young animals that were put into Pilansburg and there weren't older females for them to learn from. And so we then had what is effectively a, a group of elephants that had not had the experience of living in this multi-generational society. And we did a, a couple of things in terms of, of playing to them. We played them elephant sounds that they knew. In other words, we played them noises or sounds from elephants from their own population and that they knew. So from within their 
herd or from the same population, but not from their herd. In other words, they were unfamiliar, they uh, knew nothing about it. And on the left-hand side at the top, we have the uh, elephants from Amboseli, and those are the normal elephants. And they didn't react that strongly to familiar sounds. They reacted a bit more to unfamiliar and most long, strongly to alien elephants. In other words, if a strange elephant comes into the system, you need to be concerned and worried because there may be conflict. The Pilansberg elephants, the ones that didn't grow up in that uh, multi-generational society, they responded the same to all of them, whether they're familiar or unfamiliar or alien. We then also played the lion roars uh, for the same way as we did in the previous experiment. And we played them one or three lions. And if you look at the, uh, the, the two graphs at the bottom are just different measures of assessing their reaction. Um, and on the left-hand side, it says a &P, that's from Amboseli National Park. And the right-hand side is Pilansburg National Park. And you'll see the elephants in Amboseli don't react to one lion, but they do react to three lions, whereas the elephants in Pilansburg react the same to one or three lions. So they don't have the experience to know that one lion isn't a, a threat, whereas three lions is. And it is important how they react because when they react to a predation threat or any threat, one of the things that they might do is they might stampede away. And when that happens, often the babies get isolated and they become more vulnerable to being attacked and killed by lions. So you should only react when it's the most appropriate time to react in order to protect yourself and not put yourself at risk. The second um, experiment that I, I, or study that I want to talk about is the study that I mentioned that I got involved with in 1997, and that was in Pilansburg National Park. As I said, the elephants that came to Pilansburg were from uh, the culls, they were young animals. And so the males that grew up over the years in Pilansburg didn't have any adults that uh, they could learn from. And what happened is, as they got to about uh, 17 years old, they started coming into that condition of must. And that condition of must made them very aggressive, not only to each other, but in this case also to rhino. And what was happening is that the elephants were chasing rhino, as in the picture on the left, and they were uh, stabbing them with their tusks and killing the rhino. And they killed over 50 rhino in Pilansburg. And the same thing happened in Shishlu and Fulosi Park where uh, the elephants also were uh, uh, introduced as orphans. And uh, Rob, sorry, yes? can, I, can I just quickly interrupt? Uh, because we seem to uh, somehow have a very strange problem with Zoom. Um, so it might be, so don't get a fright when, we, when we're gonna get kicked out. This is the first time that this is actually happening. Apologies for that. Um, so if we're gonna, uh, gonna get kicked out, please use the same login uh, to re-log in. I, I don't know what the problem is, uh, but we'll, if, if just in case you're getting kicked out, uh, please use the same link and we'll um, uh, log in please again. Sorry about this. No, that's fine. Um, so um, I used, yeah, as I said before, my studies in my PhD were about social species and dominance and hierarchies. And what we figured out was that the hierarchy was missing from these, the elephants in Pilansburg because there were no older males. And what happens in normal society is older males dominate the young males and they prevent them coming into this must condition. And it's only when the young males get bigger and bigger to their late 20s, early 30s, that they're actually big enough to be. What I'm going to do now is um, just shift gear a bit. I'm going to talk about some of the work that um, uh, my uh, PhD student Antoinette van der Bart has been doing, um, looking at the benefits of elephants and looking at uh, the importance of valuing elephants. <laughs> Can we just ask everyone to mute, please? Um, so what we, what we, have done is we've quantified all of the different ways that elephants are valued by people, the services they provide to people, and the benefits that we derive from elephants. And the 
benefits can be benefits to nature, or they can be benefits to people in a very direct way, or they can be other ways that we might uh, value elephants. And they, uh, what we've identified is the uh, values from the left, starting with intrinsic values. So those are just that elephants um, are part of nature and they have value just being part of nature. It's not necessarily that people benefit from that. It's, it's a more holistic viewpoint. Um, ranging all the way to the other side where we're getting cultural and spiritual uh, benefits from elephants. What we identified is a number of uh, areas that are not contained within the classification that's currently used uh, to look at values. And those were the moral values that uh, you see on the right hand side. And those are, are, are values that are much less tangible, but they're very important to people. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, and uh, what we also identified is the perspective of values of nature is that nature contributes to people. And it's a one way uh, biodiversity. Um, can we ask people to mute, please? Um, and so we have a one way chain of nature, uh, uh, biodiversity benefiting people and we achieving good societal outcomes from nature. But what, what is missing is a feedback loop in terms of society promoting biodiversity so that you don't have a one-way chain, but you have a, a, a positive feedback loop. So of those 16 different categories of values, each of them has uh, particular elements where we benefit from elephants. I'm not gonna go through them all, but just to share with you that we identified 90 different ways in which uh, people and nature are benefiting from elephants. Um, and the intrinsic values, we have uh, you know, the issue that they've got very complex cognitive minds, they sentient, those elements that are described in their society. Uh, they improve the integrity of nature through migration processes and connecting habitats together. Uh, they regulate ecosystems through the engineering, digging up uh, water holes in rivers, etc. And they also provide uh, food and medicinal uh, benefits. For example, in terms of uh, there's some pharmaceutical uh, benefits that people are identifying in elephants, where they may have a gene that will help us fight cancer. And then there's a lot of them under livelihoods and employment. They create jobs, there's ecotourism, there's uh, trophy hunting of elephants, uh, there's sales of elephants, a whole industry that revolves around elephants. Um, and then there's a, the aesthetic, the artistic work, the number of pictures that we have of elephants, paintings of elephants, um, etc. And then it goes all the way to cultural and spiritual elements where elephants are symbols, they're religious, they've got a philosophical uh, significance, uh, they're in folklore, um, they talismans, and they're also part of uh, uh, national heritage, for example. Um, what we um, also identified is, is the, the areas on the right that speak about social cohesion, how elephants bring people together through various social compacts around elephants, um, that they balance out people's values and appreciation. Uh, they've got a, gro a global reputation. And then there's, uh, for example, in terms of human rights, having elephants in the system, I spoke about the matriarchal society, which speaks to gender equality, um, the participation of indigenous peoples in benefiting from elephants and living with elephants. Um, and uh, I'll speak about issues around environmental justice. So elephants provide 90 different ways that uh, they uh, can potentially help us. Now, what we've got in our uh, system is we have um, a protection of nature and a protection of 
the environment and the protection of elephants in, in national parks. And what we find is that the focus of national parks or areas where elephants occur is to protect the natural system. And in the natural system, we have... Uh, can we mute, please? Thanks. Uh, we have biodiversity, which is things like elephants or other species. We've got the ecological infrastructure, which is what we call things like trees and habitat and things like that. And those provide then ecosystem services. And those are those benefits that I was talking about in terms of the elephants benefiting us. There are also potential disservices. For example, elephants might uh, uh, kill large trees. Elephants might uh, uh, eat crops. They might attack livestock or they might... Um, Rob, you're breaking up. And kill people. So there are elements where there's a disservice to people. And my camera off. Um, so just let me know if it. And those fences are often a barrier to the people on the outside of those national parks. And we'll be aware of places like Kruger National Park that has 2 million people living on the boundary. People who've been to Pilansburg will see it surrounded by people. If we go to Shushlu and Filozi Park in northern KZN, there's communities of people living all around the park. And the challenge that we're facing at the moment in South Africa is that those parks are coming to trust. A month or so, we had a, a German tourist that was uh, killed outside Mumbi Gate. And one of the reasons that's happening is that the community there is dissatisfied with not benefiting from Kruger National Park. In other words, there's a fence. They see people going to the park and enjoying it, but they don't see any benefit to them. They also suffer the disservices of elephants that break out of Kruger Park and uh, uh, destroy their infrastructure, uh, eat their crops, and also uh, uh, conflict with, the, with people. And so what's happening is we have a fence, but we don't have any flow through the fence to people. And so we're decreasing the benefits to people, but we're increasing the impact on people. So people are being impacted, but they're not benefiting in any way. And what happens then is we don't have societal outcomes. So people are not benefiting, they're not uh, getting uh, uh, wealth, and they're not getting all of those 90 benefits that I spoke about. And so there's no real compact or agreement about having these parks. And that's the challenge that we're facing in South Africa at the moment, because there's no benefits. What they do uh, in response is they start posing a risk. For example, they steal the fences, they might go into the park and poach elephants. And there's a number of ways that they, uh, uh, the system is being destabilized. What we looked at then is, well, what's going on with the system? And it's actually not about the elephants and how we're managing our elephants, but it's rather about the people side of the equation. And this diagram here shows at the top a chain that goes all the way from the left to the right, where the human benefits are being promoted and the human impacts are being reduced. So what we do as part of our work is we try and understand how can we help humans benefit more in a broad sense, in an inclusive sense, and how then can we also reduce the disservices that people might uh, feel, which then promotes broad societal outcomes. Everyone is benefiting, and there's then a social compact or an agreement that this protected area is a good thing to have, and the biodiversity and its benefits are a good thing to have. The threats are reduced because people are benefiting and we can then reduce poaching by ensuring that people benefit in other ways. So what's happening then is we are promoting the integrity of nature. In other words, the system, the natural system is not being threatened, but more importantly, we're promoting social cohesion and we're promoting a feedback loop amongst people. And those together then ensure that the system becomes sustainable. 
But in order for this to happen, we need to understand which eyes to look at the system with. And those are the filters that we've identified as important. The filters of good governance, environmental justice, in other words, that we have equality, we have uh, justice, we have uh, dignity, respect, and all the other uh, elements of human rights, and also the intergenerational legacy where people can see their children benefiting from having this system and then promoting its, its sustainability. So um, what we've been doing is saying, well, well, how do you do this in practice? And part of what Antoinette did is um, she worked at a, at a game reserve and she, uh, at, which had multiple owners and asked the residents in the game reserve, in other words, the people uh, who own the game reserve or benefiting from the game reserve, and also community residents around the game reserve. And she asked a, a number of questions. And uh, these questions on the left are the kind of benefits that people might be getting and wanted to know, well, does the game reserve residents, do they benefit? What do they say about this and versus the community residents? And there was quite a lot of cohesion between the two groups. So the existence value of elephants is where people want elephants to exist because it's, it's, it's nice for people to have elephants out there. And you'll see that that was pretty much top. Um, it wasn't about we must benefit from elephants, but you know, there is an important element of having elephants. Both groups agreed that there must be community development and that that comes through uh, photo tourism, job creation, um, and those elements are, that are going to uh, promote community development. What's interesting as well is that both groups also identified well-being through viewing elephants. In other words, that when you, when you can see elephants and experience elephants, it improves your own well-being. And they also emphasize that intrinsic value of elephants. In other words, that elephants should uh, exist uh, just because they're elephants, not because we necessarily benefit from them. Um, there were other elements that were uh, less strongly supported, and those are down towards the bottom. But what is interesting is if you look at the religious, spiritual, and cultural element, there's a not equal sign. And the not equal sign says that the community on the right-hand side put, proposed that much more strongly than the residents. So religious, spiritual, and cultural elements were very important to the community, as was, for example, traditional medicine, whereas the uh, um, uh, residents in the uh, um, game reserve emphasized things like photo tourism because that was how they were making their money. But if you look at this overall, if we can identify what people are aspiring to, we can then identify ways to accentuate that. So part of religious, spiritual, and cultural is we need to give people around the reserve access to the reserve to experience those elements and those values and benefits of elephants. At the moment, there's a fence and they're not allowed to come in. And similarly with traditional medicine and traditional uses, people need access to experience those. And when there are barriers like the fence or even a, a, a figurative barrier that uh, prevents this from happening, we have that breakdown uh, which was the first graph that I showed you. Um, I just want to uh, deviate a bit to talk a little bit about uh, uh, elephant stress and kind of uh, why it's a concern. So what we do, and uh, I think Audrey's still on the on the call, but that's Audrey in, in the bottom left was one of my students collecting fresh dung. And then uh, those of you from the department will know Sertion, who was a student in the department many years ago, also collecting fresh dung for our project. And from that dung, we can analyze stress hormones and we can then see, well, how are elephants reacting to different things? And we also uh, use radio collaring of elephants to understand where they move in the reserve. So what we have at the bottom are three different reserves and the red areas are where they spend more time and then the blue areas, they spend less time. And they have these red areas that are refugia. They're areas where they go, where they feel safe, that they're not a lot of people. 
Um, and those of you who know the Pilansberg in the middle will know that those hot red areas towards the top are in areas where there are not a lot of tourist roads. Um, and then uh, the other uh, uh, element that we can do with the collars is we can see how they walk. And the top left has two tracks of elephants. The left-hand one is when the stress hormones are low. In other words, it's their basal level. They're not stressed. And the right-hand one is when their stress levels are high. And that is uh, uh, showing them different behavior. When their levels are low, they wander around outside of those hotspots. And then they move up to another one. When their levels are high, they concentrate in the refuge at the bottom. And then they sprint across the open area to the refuge at the top and that's important because when an elephant is stressed it's more likely to cause a problem in terms of uh, conflict and in fact that's St Lucia and that's where uh, uh, staff members were actually killed by elephants who attacked them when they were in that uh, zone in between them. Um, another example of where we use stress uh, hormones to understand the elephant behavior is the bottom left is uh, elephants near Pilansburg. And there are a few interesting things I just wanted to, to share there is uh, when the, the graph goes up, it means they're stressed. And one of the elements that stressed them was a Johnny Clegg concert that took place at uh, Sun City and the elephants reacted to it. And then also a thunderstorm. Elephants are scared of thunder just like we are. But it is important as well to understand this because for example, there's been proposals to uh, expand mining around national parks or Shishlu and Fulosi Park. And one of the elements that has to be considered in environment in environmental impact assessment is what is the noise going to do to animals? And like elephants, if they have this continual noise, they then become chronically stressed like people and their behavior changes when they're chronically stressed. The uh, second element I wanted to share here was the uh, reaction to tourists. And what we have at the top is a low reaction when the vehicles are far away. And then as you get closer, the elephants react more. So if you're too close to the elephants you're in their comfort zone and they're becoming stressed. And similarly, the, the two game drive peaks at a small reserve that has game drives were uh, at the time when their levels were more elevated. So as tourists, we have to also understand that we negatively affecting elephants as well. And then the last element I, I wanted to share was about tourist sentiment. So those values that I, I talked about, and I talked about local communities that uh, want to access elephants for a whole range of different reasons, including uh, livelihoods and jobs, but also spiritual and cultural ones. But people all over the world value elephants and they value our elephants. Um, even if uh, uh, they're not seeing our elephants, they're still concerned about them. And what we've been doing is analyzing social media to understand what people are saying about elephants. And what this is showing us is that the issue of poaching, hunting, killing, or trophy hunting of elephants, people are very concerned about. And these are the words that get picked up. People generally uh, around the world are not happy about elephants being killed. And that's part of the empathy and connection people have with elephants in terms of the society that elephants have, their sentient nature, what I explained at the beginning of the talk. And if we uh, look at the bottom graphs, um, the uh, green line is the zero line. Anything above that people are, are happy about and anything below it, they're unhappy. And you can see on average, the, the uh, values are below the line. But what is interesting as well, when you look at hunting before 2010, the uh, sentiment towards hunting was actually positive but that's declined very quickly over the last 12 years or so. And that's indicating a global shift against hunting. And it's important to understand that because hunting is a very important economic activity for a lot of areas in South Africa, not our national parks, but privately owned areas. And so there's a, a contestation at the moment about 
whether hunting should continue and whether there might be consequences for tourism if hunting continues and also what alternative land uses or what alternative practice, practices can people have? In other words, which of those 90 benefits should people be prioritizing and which of them should they be uh, thinking about much more carefully? So elephants inspire greatness. That's the tagline of UKZN if, uh, for the colleagues who are not from UKZN. Um, and they're very uh, uh, much linked to humans. And in terms of human evolution, we've evolved with elephants in a lot of different ways. Um, they're very much part of uh, culture, spirituality, and those kind of moral values that we need to be uh, uh, behaving morally towards elephants. Um, and there are all these different benefits that we can derive from elephants but which we often are not deriving, or in fact, we're getting disservices. And that's a challenge that we're facing. And the issue here is not about how do we conserve elephants. The elephants in South Africa and Southern Africa have increased enormously over the last uh, 20, 30 years. But uh, so we don't have a challenge conserving elephants. What we do have a challenge with is the people side of the equation how do we ensure that people want to continue to conserve elephants and that people are not uh, 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 being uh, marginalized and uh, excluded and suffering disservices to the extent that they're willing to undermine uh, elephant conservation and elephants. And that's the, the challenge that we're facing at the moment. Um, and that's a, an area of our research that we're focusing a lot more on. Um, that's also part of our work that we're doing as the African Elephant Specialist Group. As Tanya indicates, I'm co-chair there. And we're trying to get at some of these elements, uh, not about the biology of elephants, but actually about the uh, sociality of elephants and of the people side of the equation. And that's a, a big challenge, but also uh, something that I think we have to get right or we may in fact lose our protected areas and our biodiversity. Thank you very much. I just want to thank the whole team, the students, staff, collaborators, conservators, funders, and then of course the elephants. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, again, our apologies for the, for the, for the problems uh, that we had. Uh, first of all, thank you for this brilliant talk, um, and I really, really enjoyed it. And and we've been uh, recently to to Shlushlu and Filosi with the um, with with some of our students and and so on. And we saw like a nice little family of elephants sitting right standing right next to the door, and you know having a shower uh, at a water hole. And I thought that was so so. Uh, amazing to be quite honest and and uh, then on the other hand you have the other experience where you know you you're confronted suddenly with a with a big elephant and he rocks for backwards and forwards and starts trumpeting and it always looks like as if you're going to attack him uh, attack you so so my my question to you is and and I always have the right to to ask the first question which is always quite nice is is how do you actually behave if you have a very aggressive elephant you're sitting in the car you have a very aggressive elephant which is basically right in front of you do you basically start backing backing uh, going back with your car do you stop switching off the motor or what what do you actually do so um it's a very important question um there's a, a group uh, the elephant specialist advisory group um which is a, a group of people who have uh, studied elephant behavior and, and, and understand that they've actually developed guidelines for people in terms of um, how to interact with elephants and also we developed guidelines for reserves so one of the the key things that we developed was based on those results that i showed you that first thing to do is not to get into an elephant's comfort zone you stay out of the elephant's comfort zone and therefore it's not going to react to you. And that's where instead of being up very close to the elephant, you stop at least 30 meters away from the elephant. Now we discussed this at Pinda Game Reserve, which is a private game reserve. And everyone thinks, well, Pinda has to drive off road and go close to elephants, etc. cetera. Um, and we went through it with them. We said, well, elephants behave naturally if you're far away from them, you'll have a better experience. They won't go off into the bush. 
And so they said, actually, that's right. We're now going to change our rules and train our guides to stay further away. Then when uh, we spoke to Ezembello about it, we said, well, they said, no, we can't do that. We won't be competitive. I said, well, the private game reserves are doing it. And so Ezembello also putting in place those kinds of guidelines. And so the principle there is, is firstly, you don't get close to elephants. And then the second one is also about human behavior. And what happens is guides who regularly in Shishlui and other reserves come close to the elephants with the intention of almost scaring their guests. And the guests then feel they've been saved by the, by the guide from the elephant. Afterwards, the adrenaline settles and so they give a big tip. And so you've got this negative reinforcing syndrome, which is purely about human behavior. And what that means is the elephants learn bad behavior and they then have to uh, potentially be uh, euthanized because they become a risk to people. So part of what we're trying to do is manage the behavior of people on the reserves. In terms of what to do, it depends on the circumstances. Ideally, you should stop soon. And before the elephant starts coming towards you, you kind of read its signals and you move away. Um, if it's already kind of coming towards you, um, often the best solution is to turn off the engine um, and to be quiet and let it move away. But it's elephants are uncertain, so it depends on the circumstances. So when I, whenever I'm in a in a game reserve with, with elephants, etc., is the first thing I do is I stop soon, and I also make sure no one stops behind me. And if someone's stopping behind me, I make a plan <laughs> to get out of there before I'm blocked in. And uh, it's always difficult, but the, yeah, you've got, you've got to be sensible about it. And okay. my best experiences with elephants are from further away rather than close by. They behave not, not naturally that, when you see them. Yeah, I, I, I also like them for, close away. Ellen, uh, you want to quickly unmute yourself uh, because we, we we are basically rushing. So if you want to quickly ask your question, Ellen. Hello, Rob. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, so I've, I've written my uh, question. Is do you use uh, do ecological modeling with a savanna ecological model? Uh, like an individual based model that includes elephant movements and social structure. Um, thanks, Alan. So, um, yes, yeah, so one of our projects that we ran in Kruger, it was a collaboration with Wageningen University and also with uh, Mark Kugenau, who developed the Savannah model, is that we developed it further for looking specifically at that in Kruger, trying to understand linking it to tourism and the economic value that we can derive from elephants and looking at managing the system, for example, closing water holes, et cetera. So you can use models to, you know, to simulate uh, different elements of the system in order to understand what the outcome would be. Um, so yes, we do. I don't personally do modeling, but I collaborate with, with modelers who do that work. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ellen. Um, we have five minutes left. So, Michelle, quickly, if you want to ask your question. Hi, Rob. Thanks. So good to hear you. Um, I was just one. I, I mean, I assume this is true, but I was just wanting to hear from you. Um, does your world revolve entirely around elephants or do you see your work with the social issues and how to solve them with regards to conservation as being broadly applicable to all species and not just elephants? So you just use elephants as the sort of core for your work, but it actually translates across to all conservation issues. Um, so that's correct. So we use elephants as a case study because it is very tangible to everyone. Um, elephants are flagship and an umbrella species. And uh, for example, that reserve that I mentioned, the community around the reserve is against the elephants because they're not benefiting. So elephants get singled out because they're foremost in everyone's minds. There are other iconic species, such as lion and rhino, et cetera, that are also tend to be singled out by people. Um, they tend to be the ones that either impact on people, affect people, or uh, people are very aware of. But we should also be aware that uh, a whole range of species are, for example, totems, traditional totems for people, um, and different clans have different totems. So those animals or those species are 
also giving those cultural, spiritual, et cetera, values uh, in addition to other values. Elephants, we could identify 90 values because they also have been well studied, but we can assume a lot of those values also apply. They just haven't been documented in the literature. So yes, it is much broader than elephants. Um, thanks. Okay, Michelle, that answers your question, hopefully. Okay, so uh, we're coming closer to the end of the year. And um, of course, everybody needs a much deserved break. So you can see from today, um, the stress doesn't end, uh, even at the end of the year. So again, our sincere apologies. But I also would like to take this opportunity to, ta uh, to thank this year's presenters, um, Dr. Sandy Lindenrele, Ms. Ziti Mankise, Mr. Justin Pringle, Professor Fernando Abriccio, Professor Tafatsma Mabodi, and last but not least, Rob. Uh, thank you very much for giving up your time and sharing some of your, your very exciting, and this is, I think this is absolutely fantastic, uh, research that you do, and, and also and also insights in, in specific areas of science that we usually won't, won't see. Um, you can access the recordings of previous lectures on our website if you go to uh, stack.ukzn.ac.za and you go on the videos, uh, there are the previous uh, previous recordings, and I hope that we can get Rob to, to just do another recording for us as well. Um, I would also like to thank the people in the background, of course, uh, Sally as being the main driving force behind the scenes. Uh, the ladies from our college office and numerous other organizations for spreading the message and Asok Raj uh, for designing the wonderful invites. So as indicated, uh, we are going for a break and we will be, we'll, but we will be back, uh, back next year uh, because I still think that it's, it's quite important to, to let other people, uh, let other people know what we are doing. I wish, or the university wishes you all a safe and fun-filled festive season, and I hope to see you all back next year, um, when it is again, uh, what do scientists do? And please now, if you can just use the last two minutes uh, to unmute yourself and put your hands together for Professor Rob Slotter. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Much appreciated. Thank you, Thank you Rob. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. And again, our apologies. This is this is the first time that this happened. Uh, so um, uh, Sally is going to investigate what the problem is and and why it suddenly decided uh, UKZN doesn't do it can only do like forty minutes. <laughs> okay, everybody, have a wonderful festive season, and uh, see you all next year, hopefully. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye, everyone.